Chapter 20, Q&A. I got in my car and drove over to the library. The old hardwood floors squeaked lightly as I walked in, but not loudly enough to wake the librarian dozing behind the reference desk. He looked comfortable, and I was glad to have the place to myself. I wandered the aisles, scanning book titles, and hoping something would catch my attention. The floor squeaked again near the reference desk, and I assumed the librarian had woken up. I'd just keep quiet, and he'd never know I was here. The books didn't always seem to follow any particular order. It seemed like some shelves had simply been arranged as the books arrived. In a section mixed with classic science fiction and history, I found a copy of Les Miserables and pulled it from the shelf. I had always wanted to read it, but had never gotten around to it. I felt a light tap on my shoulder and spun around, startled. There stood Annetta, grinning up at me. Hi, she whispered. Her green eyes sparkled, and she looked happy to see me. I saw your car out front. You look great, I said, and surprised myself by not tensing up. What's your reading? she asked. I was looking for anything good, I answered. Got any recommendations? That's a good one, she said, pulling the book from my fingers. One of the best, in fact. Just then, the entrance floorboard squeaked again. Annetta grabbed my arm and tugged me down the aisle. This way, quick, she said. We ran as quietly as possible to a back corner of the library, and she opened a small door leading into a room with a few chairs, a large wooden table, and walls full of dusty books. This is where I always come when I don't want to be disturbed or spied on. She closed the door silently, and we sat down at the table. Yesterday was fun, I said, eager to start up where we left off. She nodded her head in agreement, then launched directly into a continuation of our interrupted conversation. You still owe me some answers. Then you owe me some questions. Annetta shook her head at that. As I recall, I asked you a question, she reminded me, and somehow ended up answering it too. I'll answer this time, I promised. Okay, she assented. What attribute do you most want to develop? Courage, I answered quickly. Three points for speed, she said with a half smile, and minus five for insincerity. Your turn. I didn't have such a good question on the tip of my tongue. I'd have to make up the difference with more speed points. When nothing came to mind quickly, I fell back on a time-proven classic. What's your favorite color? I asked. Blue. No, green. Or red. Or, or yellow, she appended at the last second, then confessed. I don't really have favorites. I just like everything. What good is having a favorite if it limits you to only one choice? Wow. Maybe there was no such thing as a simple, ordinary question with this girl. Before I had a chance to ponder the implications of her answer, she came at me with her next question. What's the hardest thing you've ever done? It's no wonder Netta ended up doing most of the talking. I didn't have quick answers for any of her questions, but she never ran out of things to say. So rather than thinking and figuring out everything this time, I just said the first thing that came to my mind. Just living. Elaborate, she commanded. Growing up, I continued, moving along day by day when you never have time to figure out exactly where you're heading or what you really hope for. Just meeting all the day-to-day -day challenges means you never quite catch up with yourself. Give me a concrete example, she demanded. Well, I thought, that's hard because after all the little trials pass, then they don't matter anymore and you see that they weren't such a big deal in the first place. But that's hindsight, and it doesn't make the present moment any easier. Good answer, Annetta said, but give me a specific example of one of the little trials. I think it's my turn now to ask a question, I objected. Then ask, what's your greatest goal? Just to live, Annetta answered quickly, then moved immediately back to her question. Give me an example. Elaborate, I told her. Too slow, she ruled. I already asked my question. I got the impression that once she had her mind made up, arguing would do no good. Okay, waking up in the morning when you know you just have to work all day and you still won't catch up. Things like that. Netta thought about that for a moment, then nodded her head. Good enough. Your turn. Every now and then, I felt an impulse to glance at my phone to check my messages and make sure I wasn't missing out on anything interesting. My follow-up thought each time was how grateful I felt for the lack of service in Amber and for Annetta's undivided attention as a result. Anywhere else in the world, dozens of guys would be constantly clamoring for the attention of such a pretty, intelligent, charming girl like this. 
We swapped questions for another half hour, sometimes laughing, sometimes following ideas and tangents, sometimes asking pointless questions just to keep the momentum going. What's the square root of 2,604? <laughs> Annetta paused and gave me a withering look that said, are you serious? I don't know, she answered, 50 something. What's your greatest fear? A few days ago, I'd have known the answer. Talking to Julie and revealing the fool I was. Somehow, I had gotten through that one, and things had turned out not great, but far better than I had feared. And now, maybe fear of reverting to my cowardly self and wasting my life and never getting what I really want. And what did I really want? I was beginning to suspect that it was Annetta. So I didn't dare admit my greatest fear, because then she would ask a follow-up question, and I wasn't ready to tell her that I wanted her. I would have to build up my courage for a while first. Me? I answered innocently. Afraid? Answering with another question is not allowed. What's your greatest fear? Giant, ravenous, super-intelligent, man-eating bats. Alnetta laughed so hard at the unexpected answer that tears came to her eyes. Liar, she accused. What's your biggest fear? I shot back at her. Clowns. Liar, I accused back. Giant clowns who knock down skyscrapers and shoot acid from their eyes. I just shook my head incredulously. Do I have to be honest? She asked. Of course. What good is asking and answering questions if you're not honest? She lowered her eyes and thought for a moment longer. Then I pass on that question, she finally said. Not fair, I objected again. What good is asking questions if you don't answer them? Annetta ended the argument by refusing to argue. She reached across the table and held one of my hands, then begged with a shy smile, ask me a different question? I squeezed her hand back and felt my heart rate double. I definitely wanted this girl. I imagined driving up from school on weekends, sometimes bringing Annetta down to school to meet my friends, take her hiking in the snow or through spring wildflowers and growing to be the best of friends or better. Impulsively, I slid one hand up her wrist to wrap my fingers around her elbow and draw her a little closer to me, then without thinking, asked the first question that came to mind. Do you think you might like me as much as I think I like you? Annetta's smile faded. What are you trying to do to me? She asked slowly. Her eyebrows raised and I watched her eyes brim with gently sparkling warm water, though no tear ran down her cheek. She looked half happy, half in heaven, and half tired, like the question had hurt her. I wanted to answer her question, but I didn't understand her reaction and had no idea what I should say. She watched me for a moment longer before looking down at the table and our hands. She let go of mine and picked up the book again. Shall we read? she asked. I nodded, and she began to read out loud from chapter one. A few pages later, the moment had passed, leaving me to wonder what it all meant. Chapter 21 Letting Go The early chapters of Les Mis follow the life of the priest Bienvenu. Because the musical could never hope to cover all the detail of the 700-page book, the play only touches on Bienvenu lightly, and the depth and richness of detail that Hugo built around the man surprised me. Even knowing that the priest was a fictional character did not detract from the inspiration of his driving ambition to do good. Sometimes I got caught up in the story and listened to the plot, ideas, and details, picturing them clearly in my mind. Other times I stared at Annetta's face and listened to her clear, pretty voice as she read. After three chapters, she closed the book. This is my favorite part of the book, she said. Everyone sees this musical and thinks Jean Valjean is the hero, and of course he is, but Bienvenu is the one I admire most. Why is that? I asked. Well, the good thing about Valjean is that he changes dramatically and becomes so good and he's so giving. Bienvenu was never uneducated or a criminal, so he can't change the same way, but he does everything he can to have the best possible influence on the world. He's ambitious, but his goal is still selfless. I also like that even when he thinks he's been doing everything right, he's still humble enough to learn to be better. I think someone should write another entire musical just about him. 
Annetta seemed entirely herself again, and whatever had affected her in our earlier conversation had vanished completely. And the one thing I don't like so much about Valjean is that he totally sacrifices everything for Cosette and Marius in the end. It's the martyr thing. Everyone treats it like such an admirable act. But the fact is, if he'd have been a little more selfish and taken care of his own needs too and asked for what he needed, asked not to be left all alone, then everyone would have been happier and suffered less and been better off. Anyway. I know this is a good ending for the book because it was written to make a statement about society back then and maybe now too, but I'd just rather be more like Bienvenue than Valjean. And it makes me sad when I see people suffering when it doesn't do anyone any good. Netta stopped then and looked up. Oh, she gasped. I'm sorry. You haven't read it yet. I'm so sorry. That's okay, I assured her. I've heard the music, so I know the basic storyline. Annetta dropped her head again here. Did you know, she asked without looking up, that your grandmother is like that? Like what? I asked. What do you mean? I mean that she's been terribly lonely since her husband died. The only times I had seen grandma since then were with the whole family gathered together and she seemed anything but lonely then. The images of seeing her look so tired when she walked into the house when I had arrived, and the tears in her eyes when she told me how happy she was that I had come to visit early, flashed through my mind. How do you know? I asked. I just know, she answered. She stays busy and hides it really well. I think she does this because she doesn't want to burden anyone else, and she frankly doesn't believe there's anything anyone could do to help anyway. Most people are happy to ignore it because they're busy hiding their own pain. It's kind of an unspoken pact. Everyone just wants to avoid the pain of bringing up old wounds, and they get by pretty well for the most part. But when the wounds are fresh and deep, you know, they just won't heal without a little air, without a little love. Annetta's brow furrowed lightly as she spoke. I visit her sometimes, she continued. I find little excuses to drop in, or sometimes I just knock on the door when I know she's there and we talk. She really is one of the best people in town. Sometimes I think this community would just fall apart if she left. I wish I could have met her husband, too, but I hardly spent any time in Amber until this summer, always working and going to school, you know, and just coming for the holidays in a week or two each summer. I get the impression that those two were the models for everyone else in this town, and now Sophie is directly involved in so many people's lives, and they love her, but there's really no one who can take Andrew's place. I sighed. I didn't know what I could do to help, but I was determined to find something. I was determined to be there and to make sure Grandma had some of the love of the air that she needed. I'm sure glad you're around, Netta, I said. I mean, I'm doubly glad you're here. I reached up and took her hand on the table, and she looked up into my eyes. I looked down after a moment, and we both sat in silence with our own thoughts for a while. Finally, she pulled her hand away and spoke again. Listen, I have to tell you the truth. Andrea called and told me I'd find your car here. Of course, she also asked if I was coming right over, and I said, Oh, I wouldn't dream of ruining all the fun you and the network could have finding out for yourselves. So I waited 15 minutes, finished up what I was doing, and went out the back door and around the long way to avoid the main spies in town. I usually don't care that people are watching, but if I didn't sneak a little, the library would be swarmed by more visitors than it's had all year, and we'd have no peace and quiet. So how do you like living here? I asked. Does it ever bother you? Annette thought about her answer for a moment, and when she answered, I had the impression that she hadn't said everything on her mind. Almost everyone's really great, she answered, pursing her lips thoughtfully. There are a few strange ones, but they keep life interesting. What do you usually do around here? Do you ever get bored? I suddenly realized that I was setting up to ask her out again. I knew she worked tonight, and tomorrow everyone was going snowmobiling. I hoped that included Netta. Yeah, I sometimes miss school and all my friends there, she smiled as she thought about them. We used to skip class on a whim and drive down the coast to Mexico. There was this little beach just before Ensenada that we'd have all to ourselves. We used to build bonfires and sometimes not come home till the next morning, just in time for class. Back when I used to come here for summers as a kid, I reminisced, I didn't need anything more than a little motorcycle and grandpa or a cousin or somebody else to play with. We used to hop on that bike and go exploring. Now I realize we never got more than a mile or two away from the house. Everything was simple back then, but now now I don't think I could stay around here for that long. 
That's what I thought when I first got up here after graduating this summer, Annetta agreed. I guess I still think that, but you kind of get used to it. Maybe if I didn't know this wouldn't be forever, I'd go crazy. But I think I'll be a little sad to leave now. You get used to things, you know? Do you already have plans for where you'll go next? I hoped it would be somewhere closer to Logan in school. Maybe she hadn't found a job yet, and I could convince her to look somewhere close enough to drive to, at least on weekends, maybe more. I hoped it wouldn't be as far as Southern California, where trips would be limited to spring break or other long weekends. Yeah, she answered, a look of concern appearing on her face. We're moving to France next month. My dad got a teaching position in Marseille. I assumed the gossip would have gotten around to you already. I didn't realize how I had come to depend on it. I felt crushed inside. I didn't have any right to expect anything from Anetta, I knew. But nevertheless, I had gotten my hopes up, and the disappointment was hard to conceal. Your whole family? How long will you be there? Three years, Netta answered. But I might not stay the whole time. I haven't thought it over much. Promise to write? I asked, still trying to hide my disappointment the best I could, knowing full well she would see right through me, and hoping desperately that she felt the loss, too. Of course I'll write, Spencer, she said, and this time it was her who took my hand in both of hers. I hope you know how much I like you, she added. I wasn't going to say that to you or anyone because I knew I'd be leaving soon anyway, and it didn't make much sense to get attached to anything and make it that much harder to leave. She let go of my hand then. You understand, don't you? Yeah, I answered. Of course. What else can you do? I meant to imply that Annetta had more options to consider than simply leaving, but she didn't seem to catch on. Not much, she agreed. Still, I said, then didn't know how to finish. I wanted to tell her that we didn't have to assume she would leave when the time came, that we ought to consider the possibility of finding something worth staying for, and that I couldn't help getting attached, and I still wanted to spend as much time with her as I could, that I didn't care about how hard it would be to let go. I still wanted to hold her hand now. Don't you think maybe... And again, I didn't know how to finish the sentence. It seems too presumptuous of me to suggest that I might become more important to her than France. It seemed downright ridiculous, in fact, to assume that after only three days... No, Spencer, don't even think about it. I'm sure it won't be easy saying goodbye to you, but let's not make it harder, okay? Please? If she hadn't said please, I'd have persisted. I didn't want to be one of those who suffered in silence and did no one any good. But if that's what she wanted, then I'd go along with it, for now. I looked at my watch, and it was already 5.30. Time had passed quickly. You've got to work in a little while, I said. Annetta looked at my watch and gasped. I'm late for dinner, she said. I'd better get home quick. When we opened the door of our room, the library was dark. The doors were locked from the outside, but not from the inside. The sky had clouded over, and half an inch of new snow had already fallen. I drove Netta home, and she invited me in for dinner, but I told her another time would be better. I knew she'd have to leave for work soon anyway, and I didn't want to get stranded with too many strangers at once, and I wasn't sure I would be quite myself with my fresh disappointment and new concern for Grandma.